and welcome to the future of football. Now, this is going to be a brand new show brought to you by The Athletic. Uh, we are actually going to try and launch a new show in the middle of football's hiatus. But what we're planning to do over the next few weeks is spend an hour or so in the company of some of The Athletic's top writers to discuss the current state of football, debate some of the biggest issues affecting our favourite sport, and hopefully how, if it could be improved upon its return. We're going to start with the Premier League, which I'm sure we'll have some of you moaning who is all about the Premier League. But in particular, the so-called big six, top six, has the league created this power base now that enables them to totally dominate? Nearly two-thirds of the teams simply now just battle it out to avoid relegation. So is it possible to make the league more competitive? Uh, is the global success of the Premier League a myth? Does it really just represent the success of that big six? Maybe, maybe even less than the big six, maybe just a, a four of them. How do we make the Premier League more equal? Does it even need to be? This is the future of football brought to you by The Athletic. And for our first show, we have lined up three of The Athletic's top writers to take us through this debate. David Ornstein, George Culkin and Ed Malian are with us. Although, George, uh, I particularly liked your comment before we started recording and that we've picked a writer from The Athletic's team who has hardly anything to do with the top six. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> hopefully that's hopefully that's appropriate in some ways. I mean, I, I get to watch a lot of really mediocre football um, and have and have done for and have done for a long time. So, I mean, I do have fairly jaundiced views uh, about the Premier League. Um, so, yeah, maybe that maybe that's appropriate in some ways. Let, let's let's just go back historically here, because uh, and I'll come to you, David, first of all, and then Ed, yeah. you chip in as well. Of we originally had a big four, really. And then when the big, f but when did that big four come into being? And then when did it become a top six? Around that sort of mid to late 2000s, when the English teams were, were regularly occupying those final slots in the Champions League, there was a, a period where they, I think it was three of the four semi-finalists. Um, the guys will correct me if I'm wrong. That was when the four sort of uh, expanded. Ed? Oh, Sorry, I was I was just trying to double check something that I had an instinct of in my head. Uh, the top four to big six <laughs> question is interesting for me because fundamentally, um, it, it has morphed constantly. Um, like it, it's it's actually a while since we've had the same four teams entering the Champions League. Um, you know, one year after the next. So I think fundamentally, all we're going to say is that this is the richest clubs in the league and, and, and I think when you plot them out on a graph and I think we've, we've seen the Swiss Ramble and Kieran Maguire some of the best finance guys around when they cover these teams and they, and they do the graph you can clearly see where the, where the big divide is and um, there's a team like Everton who could bridge that gap um, I think Wolves are probably best positioned to, to add themselves to this group but of course, the most existential threat now is that these aren't going to stay as the top six of the Premier League anymore. And, and you know, there's the threat of European Super League. And with these top teams having the sway they have, they can use their, their financial position to leverage themselves to get more money from the Premier League or eventually to leave. And, and for me, this period of, of coronavirus is a, a period where we've stopped all sports. And this is an opportunity to start football again and try and fix some of the problems like structural problems that we saw before um, I just don't have that much confidence that football is going to take this opportunity I think that's a fascinating thing and and my starting point from this is actually to take a step step away from the top six which makes me a bit uh, annoying possibly but I look at I look at I look at football and think that if if the championship playoff game is the richest game in in sport let alone in football then how screwed is our system? Because that is a game which effectively is about failure. It's about the teams that haven't got into the automatic places for promotion, and it's the richest game in sport. Now, why isn't the world? Why isn't the World Cup final the the richest game in football? Why isn't the FA Cup final or or the Champions League final? Why aren't they the richest game? How how is it that? A, and for me, the Premier League or so much of the Premier League is about fear. It's about the fear of missing out. It's the 
fear of falling out of it. And, you know, more or less, you've, you've got this situation where the clubs at the top are going to get richer and richer and the rest of them are just clinging on. And that's, you know, I feel so sad as someone who's watched Newcastle all my life to see a manager like Benitez, Rafa Benitez, come to Newcastle and then spend two years in the Premier League grimly hanging on because that's all all he felt he was capable of doing. And, you know, that is the football that I watch. And that's kind of my starting point to this debate, that it's all about money. And, you know, whilst football is all about money, we lose those precious things, the competitiveness, that feeling of sporting institutions striving for something, and it's become something else. Okay, well, well let, let's take let's take that as as the as the base point here then, and and what you said, George, there of of the fear that Rafa Benitez was under in managing Newcastle for those two years for in just trying to hang on to Premier League status. Now, where that that fear is only comes from the loss of money if you drop out of that top division. Because he could have played, he could have played much more free flowing football if he wanted, and see where it took him. Well, he didn't. He didn't feel like he could do that with the kind of squad he has. I mean, I know this then gets into sort of tiresome historical, you know, debate about about that kind of thing. And he felt he was playing in a way that made the most of limited resources, and it was it was it was pretty horrible to watch. And it's got much worse this season, mm. you know, this season too. But it's it's also like the language that we use about football. I mean, the other thing that really, really pissed me off was when Sunderland were in the Premier League and each year they stayed up, stayed up and it was described as a miracle. And what that miracle allowed them to do was to lose again the following season and then lose again and then stay up and it was a miracle. It's not a miracle. I'm sorry. Leicester was a miracle. Leicester was a genuine miracle. But staying up, is is not a miracle, and the the way we describe football and the you know our use of language is all about that kind of that that monetary side of it. And you know, again, I just don't remember football being like that when when I was a kid, which admittedly was a long time ago. We didn't talk about how much players earned. We didn't talk about how much uh, you know it was worth to. You know, it was worth to to teams to stay up in in the top division. But the way we come to think about football has just changed out of all recognition. Mark, your point there about style is quite interesting because, Ed, you know, you've followed Crystal Palace for years and they tried to change things up with the appointment of Frank de Boer to go in a slightly different direction to gamble. And it's something they're going to have to think about again as and when Roy Hodgson moves on. Um, And it almost was their downfall on that occasion and it, it should have shows the perilous nature of trying to stay in the league for the money or trying to play some good football. Yeah, well, the, the way I see the Premier League at the moment is if, if you do see it as a top six um, and then 14 other teams, um, if you follow one of the 14 other teams like I do, you know, and I kind of see the league through a palace lens anyway because I'm boring. But when you kind of look towards the future, it's like, what, what is the future for a club in Crystal Palace's position? Like you say, like Roy Hodgson leaves and, and with him, probably the last of those retreaded uh, experienced Premier League managers that Palace have gone through, which is Allardyce, Pulis, Pardew, um, and now Roy himself. Once he's gone... Where do you go if you're Crystal Palace? Because you know the most important thing in the future of the club is staying in the Premier League. Obviously, they don't look like they're going to compete for the top six at any point soon. So then what sort of manager do you hire next? Do you hire someone who's like Roy, who's, who's defensive, who's going to keep you in the league? Because that's worth, let's be honest, £150 million plus a year. Or do you try and do something that's going to elevate you up the table? But like, as we found with Frank De Boer, the risk is you might lose your first seven games in a row and not score a goal. So that's unfortunately what the Premier League has become. You have this choice now almost. You can either compete or not. Um, and, and really, it just makes me think, what happens if and when those big clubs disappear? Just a, just a quick one on the choice, because George mentioned the choice of language here. And, and I was really interested there, Ed, that you spoke about important for the future of the club yeah. that they're in the Premier League. 
Now, why is it important for the future of the club? Because if I drop into the championship and look at Bristol City, and I've just picked them at random, I know they've got a wealthy owner, but the, fu- their, the future of that club is not in jeopardy because they are playing championship football. No, but I grew up watching us mainly in the championship, to be honest. Um, Did you enjoy it? I mean, I fell in love with it. It doesn't mean I enjoyed it. Uh, you know, it, it's more like the thing that really... Have you enjoyed your last two seasons? So the last six seasons Palace have been in the Premier League. That makes this their most successful period in their history in terms of a stretch in the top flight. Now, obviously, they finished third in the top division once, but this is the their longest prolonged stretch in the top flight. So this is the best Crystal Palace team you've ever seen. This is the best situation the club has ever been in financially. Um, but, like, if they got relegated... You know, with the uncertain ownership status and everything that comes with it, like Palace would be in an uncertain place. It's not going to be as uncertain as the two administrations that I've witnessed in my lifetime already. But that's what happens to these clubs that go down. How many clubs have we seen that slide down once and then slide down again? Because the the reality of financially dropping from the Premier League to the Championship is hard. And if you don't bounce straight back up, it's even harder. Which, 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 of course, then raises the question of why bother in kind of why bother in the first place. And I think that's that's that thing. It's like okay, you say it's worth 150 million pounds, but what happens to that money? How, what does it get spent on? Does it just get spent on staying where you are? And if so, you know, <laughs> why? What's the, what's the point? I mean, I've had this I've had this discussion with um, with Newcastle fans who are kind of younger than me, and it's. You know, they, you know, it's that horrible debate about priorities and, you know, would you take a cup win if it meant going down as if you sort of have to have that choice. But, you know, that has been a theme of Newcastle season because Steve Bruce made a kind of vow at the start of the season to sort of have a go. And they have, albeit it's not been a cup run, it's been a cup limp because they've had to get past two League One teams after replays. But... There is this fear. It's, oh no, I, I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to drop out of the Premier League. Why? Well, you know, because it's just a place where you have to be, and it's like, yeah, but you're watching your team be really shit in the Premier League. So, what, what is the big, what's the big fascination with that? I mean, I'm, I'm 50 this year. I've never seen the team win anything in my lifetime, and I just want to know. I want to know what that feels like. I want to know. I've seen Newcastle being mediocre for their first years of my life. Then there was that, you know, brilliant, beautiful spike under Keegan. And that's how, you know, that's how I think of football. I think of his team and the way they played. And then Sir Bobby, you know, when he came back to the club he supported as a kid and we had those lovely Champions League nights and things like that. But I've seen Newcastle get relegated lots of times and it's not necessarily the end of the world. I want to see Newcastle do something. So two things here, George, then. Even even though it was still the Premier League era, Newcastle under Kevin Keegan and their rivalry with Manchester United, that 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 feels to you like very much a, a, a competition of a different era. Because the money has increased so much now. I think that in some ways, I think Newcastle played a role in changing the way we think about football. And what I suppose what I mean about that is when I when I was a kid, Newcastle was still a cup team. I mean, that sounds ridiculous now, but I was born in 1970. They'd won the Fairs Cup the year before. The last, of, you know, their previous FA Cup win was 1955. So it wasn't kind of that long before I was... Uh, born and certainly not compared with with now, and that's that. Those are the stories that I was brought up with. And every season for me, third round day would be the most important day of the year because that was the what if. That was the what if day. What if it's our turn this year? And then Newcastle go up under Kevin Keegan as the Premier League starting, and they played that extraordinary football. And he said, "Tell Alex Ferguson we're coming after him," and they did. They went after him, and they very nearly caught him. And so Newcastle and the league suddenly became um, the most important thing at a time when Sky and 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 the Premier League were, you know, were sort of reinventing themselves as well. And that argument has prevailed that the Premier League is the most important thing and being there is the most important thing. But it's it's still the same division. It's worth an extraordinary amount of money and a ludicrous amount of money now. Um, but they've sort of won the argument. And so being there and getting there and staying there and all of those things 
have taken precedent over everything else. I wonder, David, whether the financial side of it and the amount of money to stay in the Premier League sometimes gives clubs and managers an excuse to be ultra-conservative and use the finances as an excuse in some ways. And therefore, for fans that have played of clubs who are conservative and do anything at all costs just to stay in the top flight, I wonder what they think when they look at Leicester, Wolves and Sheffield United. Not just this season, in the case of a couple of those. Well, it's a mix because some of the, many of those fans will, will look at those examples and know it's possible and, and many others will know the realities. And it, it's quite striking of when, when you're an outsider in these situations. Um, I look at a team like, we've talked about Crystal Palace, a fairly impressive quite often when I see them. Um, and then you start speaking to fans at the club and Ed will know this much better than me, but there's been some real discontent this season about the way they're playing. And, and you know, there was a big piece that, that we did on The Athletic looking at the reasons why and the problems on and off the pitch. But if you look at the best statistics and, and as as Ed pointed out, they, they've had the... They're on the best sequence of, of top flight form in their history. So, uh, And just going back to one of George's points about what's the money for, well, if we look at it on the flip side, Crystal Palace are trying to build a new stand. They're trying to redevelop their academy with some very ambitious plans and provide a sort of sustainable future as a club that in that sort of catchment area is, is potentially has got such huge growth within them you know in, in that area of South London I visit and know people at a, a lot of these clubs that have the ambitions that you're talking about there Mark you know the Leicesters Everton's etc and it's remarkable how much intelligence there is and you could argue in 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 your debate about whether managers and clubs use it the money as an as an excuse you can argue that that's going all that intelligence is is being a lot of that intelligence is being wasted there are some of the most foremost brains in football working at these clubs around data and analytics and um, sports science and physiotherapy and um, strength and conditioning and and they they're doing some amazing work and that's why you say, you know, clubs who are all on the same page and have clear plans and prepare well, Sheffield United this season, for example, Wolves as well and recruit well, of course, they can get there. Um, we saw Southampton do it previously under, you know, Pochettino and they built a really good training ground and, and other clubs have, have done it as well. The, the one thing that really frustrates me is that those clubs who have those little surges like say Southampton um, you know that at any moment if they don't get everything right then they're in a relegation scrap whereas clubs at the other end of the table Arsenal Tottenham various others um, Manchester United they can get things badly wrong and just not not in terms of transfers with financial fair play but in terms of infrastructure and recruitment with to an extent within their revenues they can spend their way out of disastrous situations and some of the work i see at some of those lower clubs is so much more impressive than those at the top but they're hitting a glass ceiling and I'm sure we'll come on to that around financial fair play. So I've not answered your question in the slightest, Mark, which is typical <laughs> of me, but, but, but absolutely the, the money and, and staying put is in, in the top flight is definitely something that is a, is a safety net that they're desperate to cling on to. You mentioned Southampton, David. Southampton until recently were like the model club almost for the other 14. You know, that's yeah. how quickly these things change. Exactly. Like, if you're yeah, at that uh, level. Among those 14 teams, you know, you could be in this great world where you've got Mauricio Pochettino as manager and you've got all these great young players. And then within two or three years, you've been stripped of your director of football, stripped of your coach, stripped of your best players. And you're just another one of these teams that's fighting against relegation at the end of the day. I thought it was interesting. George used the term cup team to describe Newcastle, which is obviously uh, not something you would have called them in recent years. But the, what, the, the definition of a cup team is different now. Like... If Newcastle, Crystal Palace, Watford, Norwich are cup teams now, it's because that's their only chance of glory. You know, not because that's how they win. It's, it's because there's no chance for you to do anything in the Premier League. So there are a lot of clubs that are reduced to basically about four or five knockout games a year to try and, and do something that might constitute success. And, and that's like, can we get to the Carrell Cup semi-final? Can we get to maybe even the final like Villa did and then, and then get pumped? And then the same for the FA Cup. Why can't Newcastle 
do what Leicester, do what Southampton in that period, do what Sheffield United are doing this season with intelligence and unity and good recruitment. And so, so you can't can't do it. It. David, David, you've just answered your own question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they, can, they, can, they can win cup competitions because you basically need to win about five or six games and get a little lucky. Um, but over 38 games, the Premier League is such an efficient market now that the, the six richest teams will usually come out on top as, as the top six. And it, at worst, it will be five of them in the top six. The thing that interests me, and I'm sure this will be for another episode, talking about like European Super League and stuff, is the thing that interests me is what happens to clubs like Newcastle if the top six disappear and join a European Super League? Are Newcastle suddenly title contenders? Championship title contenders, usually, I would I would say. But um, I think that I think that mention of Southampton that that's interesting because I look at Stoke as well, and they had those three seasons of finishing ninth, didn't they, under Mark Hughes, and then suddenly it was there's that internal debate about okay, so we've done that, what do we do next? And it's from that point that it's all that it's all fallen apart, that it's all disintegrated because, because you can't reinvent yourself more than, they, more than they'd already done and they can't finish, realistically, much higher than they've already done. And so what happens is, as they fall back, the teams that come up through the, through the championship, I mean, it doesn't happen every season, but I think it's quite noticeable how teams like Sheffield United and Wolves before them, perhaps that they're exceptions, but even Newcastle when they came up under Benitez and Bryant, you come up with so much momentum because you're sort of having to properly scrap and battle every three or four days that that takes you a certain distance and the teams they're overtaking are often those teams who sort of forgotten what the point is apart from just being there in the first place and you know you see a team like Brighton this season who took the decision that you know under Chris Hewton, they were only going to get so far they've taken a sort of ambitious decision if you like to change the way they uh, play and all that sort of stuff, and it's not been easy, and it might cost them. It still could cost them, um, and you, you you sort of have to have that that sense of what you are and what do you stand for. Well, I mean, you don't get anything for finishing ninth. I mean, it, that might be their the best run in Stokes modern history. I don't I don't know, but what, what's it you know what's it got them in the end? And w- if the focus is only on that, then so much of what I would describe as the point of football is just completely lost. I wonder in all of this as well whether when we're sort of bemoaning really the the power of the top six or, or the dominance of the top six and the other 14 just hanging on in there, whether that also, the hanging on in there goes as regards when they play the top sides. And we're obviously in a year of such dominance from Liverpool, but last year such dominance of Liverpool and Manchester City. And I don't know, you go back... I mean, I just dragged a table up at random here. I had no idea who the top four would be this year, but I looked at 97-98. Arsenal won the league, Manchester United second, Liverpool third, Chelsea fourth. The big four at that stage before Tottenham and Manchester City. But Arsenal lost six games that season. United lost seven. Liverpool lost nine. And even though many of those sides in that division might well have known their place as in the other 16, as I suppose it was then, they might have given it more of a go in games against that top four. And whether one of the problems at the moment, Ed, is that teams are happy to write off, perhaps, games against certainly Liverpool and Manchester City in the hope that they can pick up points elsewhere. The first time I remember this happening, um, I think was... um, when Mick McCarthy was in charge at Wolves and they played against Man United and he basically rested all his players. That's right, yeah. uh, They were kind of bottom of the table and and getting pumped. And I think they were playing Wigan very shortly afterwards, which was obviously a much bigger game for them. Um, And how can you blame teams in this situation where where this league has become stratified and it's almost, you know, two leagues within a league? Like, I would do the same... Um, as what as what they do. If you're playing away at Manchester, if you City, if you took over from Roy Hodgson, which you know who knows where they might look <laughs> for in a, in a year's they've time, got, they've and got you to were, at least consider it. They've got to yeah. at least consider it. <laughs> so and you were you were away at Stamford Bridge uh, on one Saturday, but you had a midweek game on the Wednesday where you were at home to Southampton. 
you would definitely go weaker at Stamford Bridge ahead of the home game to Southampton. I would. I mean, we always actually do quite well at Stamford Bridge, but yeah, you do. Uh, broadly, I realised that when I picked that. Broadly, example, <laughs> no, right, the, 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 one, the place, the place that I think of in the Premier League is the hardest place to go is Man City away because even when Pellegrini and Mancini were there, they played incredibly expansive football at home and often opened you up and beat you four or five one. Um, and I think if you're going to Man City away in this day and age, it is. Comp- I know the rules in the Premier League literally say it's not, but it's understandable for a normal Premier League manager of the other 14 clubs to, to rotate and rest players because you're going in there. I mean, look, from a pure betting point of view, you're going to be like 85% favourites there, Man City, uh, to win that game. So like, it's not like you're not taking a decision that's rooted in, in maths and science and probability. You're actually taking the smart decision. Um, it does break the rules of the Premier League, as we said. But I think that, you know, if, if the big clubs can rest players, then personally, I think the small clubs should be able to rest players too. And it, it, all it is is allocating resources to where they're needed. The only crumb of comfort I can see, and I'm not a statistics person, so I'm sort of the antithesis of Ed, but um, just on the eye, th- when you're referring to that specific season, Mark, 97 to 8, I remember a lot of those games. The, the, the difference when lower teams came up against the likes of... United, Arsenal, Chelsea was staggering like from the technical level to the conditioning and the the physical fitness of of those lower teams there were regular sort of cricket scores I remember seeing a lot of them now Ed's right the divergence between the teams in terms of going to Man City going to Liverpool is still there you're still going to lose but the the gap doesn't seem that big in front of your eyes when you're seeing West Ham. They should have won at Anfield shortly before uh, the league was suspended this season. Crystal Palace won at Man City with that Townsend goal a couple of seasons ago. And and on a physical and technical and sometimes tactical level, we've seen loads of teams go to the Emirates and outsmart Arsenal. And even when Arsenal have, have nicked a result, similar at Stamford Bridge with Chelsea in their up and sort of down tumultuous recent years I actually d- and, and I know so- some of the work that's going on at these clubs and I know they're not far off and I know that they're, many of them do more impressive things day in day out and uh, on the training pitch and behind the scenes um, than some of the bigger clubs yes the, the the elite remains but I don't think the the gap in terms of the match in front of your eyes is as big as it was what's, what's I quite interesting about I that season, well I was just going to say what's quite interesting about the season that, that I've that I've picked out here is that the joint top scorers in the Premier League were Dion Dublin and Chris Sutton both with 18 however there's a Newcastle Memory midfielder like with the most Newcastle midfielder with the most bookings and the most red cards which should be quite easy for George to get uh, hang on 97 David Batty oh very uh, good very good yeah. very good anyhow George your point was going to be well I mean I've sort of seen the opposite I suppose of that I mean I've seen I mean I have seen Newcastle get some good results I mean get some very good results they've beaten Man City um, but it's 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 been playing in a way that is is about you know, damage, massive damage limitation. Yeah, it's about set. It's about setting up in a certain way, and I've seen. You know, it's 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 made my eyes bleed. I mean, I'm watching. You know, watching Newcastle at St James's Park. This up. You know, this elemental fortress, or it. You know, it has been in my living memory where you know you can use all those cliches about it being a sort of force of nature kind of place and Newcastle have been having 20 30 percent possession getting everyone behind the ball and and eking out results now that was you know Norwich have done things a very different way for example this season they've had a they've had a kind of plan they've had a style of play and it's been very impressive in in lots and lots of ways except they're going to go down um Newcastle did things very differently and you had you had someone in Benitez who's known as a sort of master tactician and all that sort of stuff and a percentage manager who decided that the best way of staying up or you know getting the best out of what he had was to was to play in that way and I found that you know I found that really really sad I mean I think I I agree with David certainly in terms of you know teams and clubs are pretty much all going to have very sophisticated Analytics. They're going to have incredible backroom teams, and they're going to have all the information and recovery and all that stuff. You would hope that all Premier League clubs will have that sort of excellence. But I do think that 
the bigger picture has changed for everybody that you know that for for two thirds of the club it's about that fear and that's how they approach the you know that is still how they approach the big games it doesn't mean they're not capable of getting results it's just done in a very different way I think the th- the theme coming through from all three of you at the moment is is this fear thing of that 14 compared to the top six and if that if that big six top six ever got themselves into trouble as David said earlier they would somehow be able to get themselves out of it they wouldn't be relegated and the reason I sort of go down that route Ed I, you know I've got all the league winners in front of me here if I go to the 80s four different clubs won the league title in the 80s if I go through the 90s four different clubs won the league title in the 90s actually 2000 to 2010 only three clubs won the league title and then back to the last decade and you've got four clubs again who've won the league title so that that pattern has remained whether it was the old first division or the premier league and in fact you know that that decade 2000 2010 if you're looking for title winners would have been the dullest because it was either arsenal manchester united or Chelsea. So actually what we're nailing down is the is the fear of 14 clubs of dropping out of the Premier League rather than a competitive balance of winning the title. Yeah, absolutely. You, you and I both follow the NFL, Mark, and that's a league that's founded on competitive parity. They have a lot of what they call levers that, that help in, ensure that the league remains very fair and competitive. And it means that teams, as a rule, go from being the worst to one of the best in about five years. Um, we obviously don't have that in the Premier League, um, and weirdly, if you look at those like that decade from like 2000 to 2010, yeah, it's pretty much United, Arsenal, Chelsea after Abramovich comes in. Um, but the, the kind of financial gap, apart from Chelsea, who came in with the first billionaire owner, the financial gap wasn't as big as it is now. Um, the rich have got richer in football and and society, obviously, over the last ten years. Um, and they know that. And, and I think we've, we've reported on it at length about how the richest clubs are using their leverage to try and get more out of the Premier League. And we've talked about Leicester a lot as well today. Now, Leicester, I don't know if you ever watched, um, uh, what's it called, House of Cards. Now, the first episode of the second season of the House of Cards, one of the best things about House of Cards as a show is it was one of those shows, um, a bit like Game of Thrones, which kind of burst onto the scene and the big thing about it was they weren't afraid to kill off main characters. And because they were not afraid to kill off main characters, you felt like you didn't know what was going to happen next. And that feeling is what we're missing right now in terms of live sport. Like, it's literally not knowing what could happen next. And I remember at the start of season two of House of Cards, sorry if you've not watched it, um, the main character just gets pushed in front of a, a, an underground train. And you're like, whoa, okay, well, they will really do anything on this show to, to throw you through a loop. And Leicester's title win kind of... I'm definitely not going to watch it now because you've completely ruined it. <laughs> yeah, I have ruined it. No, I, I, I've literally ruined it. But Leicester's title win feels ever more like the, 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 the people who write the Premier League throwing in a, you know, like a, a boomerang to kind of throw us all off and, and keep us on our toes. But really, all it did was it was just kind of solidify the hegemony of the teams at the top. It's saying, oh, yeah, okay, so like once we can have a 5,000 to one shot, but this is <laughs> never going to happen again. So what happens then? The American comparison is something that I was going to bring up and mention um, if Ed hadn't. And, I mean, I don't know, you know, I don't know a huge amount about that. But that, you know, the fact is that our richest clubs get and and biggest clubs and then the clubs who finish at the top of the Premier League get paid the, the most money. They then get into the Champions League and they get more money. And we then have that, you know, in the same way, getting into the Premier League, clubs get this huge injection of money and then coming out of it, they, they, they retain that in terms of parachute payments and then none of it is trickling down. And so that thing about the, that thing about the money, I mean, it's partially why the Premier League came into existence in the first place. So it's not going to get reversed. I mean, I can't see that it is. But, you know, it has now left us where we have these, you know, enormous obscene transfer fees, these enormous obscene wages. And, you know, the, the point you made at the very start of this sh- show about why we're doing this, if is this a chance to reset football? And is it a chance to reset, we think, to reset the way we think about football? Because... Unless there is some form of redistribution, 
particularly with what's happening now in the wider world, we are going to see clubs disappear, sadly. And we have to... I, I passionately believe we have to rethink the way we th- we think about the game full stop. I mean, I don't want to make a trite point, and this is also a dangerous point for a football journalist to make, but one of the things I'm looking forward to is actually looking forward to football again. And it's this thing where... It's every night, and it's great if you're a journalist, and it's great if you're a radio broadcaster because you've got these games every night. But it's too much. It's too much, and it's thrown in our face too much. And I, I think to be a to be a rounded human being, I have to switch football off now and do and do something else. I have to read a book, or I have to watch a film. I have to fill my head with with other things because I can't just watch football all the time. And I don't want to. I want to feel hungry for it. I want to feel thirsty for it. And I think. You know that's a that's that's a slight divergence from what we're talking about, but it's also not really. It's about it. You know, it's about what the point of football is, and and the way it's run, and and what it gives. And it's too much, and it's too much money. <laughs> and we are gonna we are gonna do a broadcasting one actually. So I'm gonna revisit that point on that one because I, I I agree with you, George. I think sometimes. When you're when you're in it all the time, as we are all lucky enough to be, there comes a point where you go, do you know what? For the for the sake of for the sake of my sanity, actually for the sake of my family, I really can't sit here and watch a Friday night Premier League game. We're gonna we're gonna you know play a game or you know watch watch a film or, or whatever it may be. I think and, just and not house of cards. Just not house of cards now. Now I've crossed that off my stuff to watch during this period. Um, and we'll t- we'll come back to that on the broadcasting. But but what happens when you know? Hopefully this is all eventually over. Will be very interesting because you can take the point, can't you, David? That football has this chance to reset and rebalance and see what happens. But then you can also look at it and go. When we're out of this, and we're, we we are assuming that there are going to be some very difficult economic times once the coronavirus is under control, the big clubs in particular are going to be the best able to cope with that difficult economic environment. So the gap could, in fact, widen further. It could, but... That's not guaranteed, Mark, because across the board, this is going to have an enormous impact in in the short to medium term Um, in terms of broadcast. uh, Sponsorships are going to take a battering. Um, There are all sorts of issues around uh, salaries and certainly salaries and transfer fees are going to come down um, in the short term. I wonder if that will level the the playing field at all. Let's see. Um, the big question is afterwards whether the the established elite re-establish themselves. I suspect that will be the case. I suspect that the broadcasting world has been quite crisis resistant in the past. The financial crises, everybody expected football to to take a big hit and, and broadcasting revenues actually rose. The appetite is there. We essentially still want to go to football matches and watch them on television and globally with a more insatiable appetite than ever. It'll be interesting to see whether the international broadcast packages are as strong as ever given that this is such a global crisis that markets that were usually relied upon, even if there was a, a crisis in the UK, would would sort of bail them out. Well, that might not be the case anymore. I, I'd be fascinated to see and, and know the views of the guys on whether there is some element of could the clubs who are being better run, being run on a more prudent basis, and that could be teams lower down the Premier League table, could be in a much better position than many anticipate here and some at the top end because all you have to look, do is look at the finances and Ed pointed out people like Swiss Ramble and, and Kieran they're not making profits the top clubs in fact they're mainly making losses I think some people might take a look at this situation now and say goodness me without financial fair play some of the biggest clubs in the world could be going to the wall here imagine if if um if some of these clubs had been spending without limit and this crisis had hit and their their owners weren't in a position to support salaries their revenues didn't cover things in in the way that uh could have happened it's unpredictable and and 
is fascinating, but I don't think that necessarily we should just assume that the big clubs will be fine out of this and the small clubs will be even worse off. I think there are some pretty well-run clubs that could cause a bit of su- a surprise, but yeah. If you look at like a club like Manchester United, right, they could dip their revenues 20-30% and they're still going to be by far bigger than almost any other football club in the world. I remember... Um, a couple of years ago we did a proper look at the United finances and just just relative to the rest of the Premier League and and this is a time when they're finishing 6th, 7th in the Premier League um, and playing in the Europa League but United could basically afford to sign like a Paul Pogba more than any other team in the world every single summer that's the that's the kind of gap between them and the rest so uh, I fear that unfortunately football reflects the society in which it exists and usually out of these sorts of situations, the rich tend to get richer and um, it's the small guys that are going to get squeezed. Uh, I know that um, a lot of the, the clubs in the lower mid table obviously are going, to use, are going to lose significant revenues. And they're unfortunately not the clubs really that we need to worry about. It's League One and League Two is where I have most fear. I think that the Premier League clubs are probably going to get looked after in the end and, and be able to look after themselves actually, you know, like a lot of them have tried to maintain their staffing levels and things like that, which I think is important. But it's going to be a difficult time coming out of the other end of this. I think we all know that. Um, All we can hope for is that maybe it changes the way that clubs operate to, you know, not spend every last penny you have getting that extra striker looking for promotion and maybe just keeping a little bit more in cash reserves. But the problem with the way that football is run is if you dangle these big pots of gold, then people are going to spend more of that gold trying to get them. And uh, until we kind of break that cycle, which is really hard to do in a competitive sport, we're going to have teams spending beyond their means always. It's interesting. We don't, I mean, I suppose at this point in where we are, we don't know what the world's going to look like in a month's time or two months' time. I mean, I, I suppose I tend to think that, you know, you look at you look at some of the stuff that's happened in this country in the last week or so, um, you see the you see people's true colours and I mean that in a positive way and in a negative way. You look at, you know, half a million people volunteering for the NHS, absolutely extraordinary, wonderful, moving. You look at the way some companies, I probably don't need to mention the one that I'm thinking um, (laughs) of at the moment because it's close to home, but, you know, attempting to make money out of this situation or certainly handling a, a situation incredibly badly and incredibly thoughtlessly. I would like to think that when we get at the end of this, we'll... We'll remember those things, the good and the bad, but we might think about, you know, football and the money we spend on football in a different way because economically it's going to be a very different landscape. And so that might have an effect throughout 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 the game. You would hope that, you know, there is a place for being smart. Leicester won the title, okay, it was a season when you know the big clubs the big clubs failed or had a bad season or were going through transition, but they you know, they were also re- rewarded for smartness, for being clever, and they still are. They still are a very f- smart football club in the way they do things. And perhaps, 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 we get to the end of this and clubs actually think, OK, we can't afford to go out on a limb like that just in case something like this happens again. I mean, you know, this, fingers crossed, this is a once in a generation or once in a decades kind of event, but you know, there could still be financial crisis around the corner or whatever, you know, so we have to be clever and we have to be more sensible in the way we do it. And then that becomes the the sort of overwhelming philosophy of football, not just chasing the money, but chasing good sense and and rethinking about why they do it in the, fo- in, in the first place. Do you think in the end, and it may, and this has nothing to do with the situation that we're currently in. It just comes back to everything that we've discussed so far. That in the end, the top six or a selection of that top six will break away to join the European Super League. And if if younger listeners uh, think that is fanciful and might never happen, it's only less than 30 years that the top clubs in England broke away to set up the Premier League. Yeah, well, we've been hearing about this for so long now. And I think, was it around September time that the most recent Champions League reform proposals that favoured the 
the elite were scrapped and they're back to the drawing board. I think it was Agnelli from Juventus who was driving it on that occasion. And it's basically a desire which is shared by many people I speak to at the top clubs to be playing more matches against um, the other big clubs. They've got a good way of persuading you when you talk to them and then you come away thinking that's absolute nonsense. But they're all speaking to each other in the ECA, the, the sort of clubs association and the EL, the European leagues, uh, have a very different view because they want to protect their own leagues. The, the, it's tricky for the Premier League clubs because they do want to be part of the elite. In a, a, they do want to be playing the Juventuses and the Barcelonas and Real Madrids and Paris Saint-Germain's Bayern Munich on a regular basis. But they also know the value of the Premier League. And I think they were quite resistant to the last set of proposals, even though they were in on the conversations because, um, you know, the the Premier League is is the sort of financially anyway the the standard bearer the 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 success story in in European football there was an executive I spoke to a while ago who was explaining to me just why the clubs are so desperate to be breaking away and playing each other and and how the appetite from their global fan base is like you wouldn't believe so we think it is sort of sacrilege to suggest taking football away from the fans in the stadium and in the UK every time the story comes up the 39th game which I'm sure you remember well Richard Scudamore's proposal to play the, the final game or one game of the season overseas suggestions around community shield being played overseas and then even the bigger proposals of of a breakaway so many people go crazy but in these circles where they're where they're looking to maximize their commercial potential their fan bases they've got millions of fans around the world in asia in australasia in all corners of the globe who they want to satisfy and and they are real fans I'm told you know I, I don't know them but I see on tours and things and um, you see their interaction through social media and they fly over to games and things like that that they are real strong passionate fans who um, in the minds of these executives and these commercial bods that they need to be satisfied and so that's why there will be and, and the money talks of course so that's why there'll be a constant a constant push and, and but, we, thing, we, but we, yeah. we already have a European Super League it's called the Champions League I mean it's, that's, <laughs> it's, it's it used to be called the European Cup and it used to be the champions of our d- domestic leagues and they played each other and then that w- and then that wasn't enough because too many times the big clubs finish second or third and that's why the Champions League was born and how much money do these people want? I mean, well, totally. If, but and and the, the, fine. I mean, the Champions League doesn't turn me on because I, I have the same problem that I have. I mean, the, the biggest problem I have is that my team aren't in it. But um, but to be slightly more serious than that, the you know the other big problem is 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 that it is always it's it's the same teams and they're playing each other year after year. And okay, you know sometimes, and it's there's too much of it. But um, you know, what is the end game here? If it's just those teams wanting to go off and play each other all the time, then let them go. Piss off, they can go. And I won't watch them. And I won't watch them. And football dies because that's not what... I, I mean, if you're telling me or if the suggestion is that, you know, Liverpool fans are kind of craving that, I don't think they are. Again, the same thing, certainly in this country. And I know the global game has changed. I know that those fan bases are incredibly important and all that sort of stuff. But I do think at some point there comes a reckoning and it might just be what's happening now that this becomes a reckoning. Quick question to you, George. A quick question to Ed and then a final thought from the three of you. If if the two Manchester clubs, Tottenham, Arsenal, Chelsea and Liverpool, left to a European Super League, Leeds, and I'm picking six biggish clubs from the championship without with all due respect to them you could pick others I'm supposed but Leeds Sheffield Wednesday Forest Derby West Brom Bristol City replace them that's your new Premier League and Newcastle won that you wouldn't have a problem with that <laughs> I wouldn't have a problem I would not I'm sorry that just makes no. me smile that just makes me <laughs> smile out of massive happiness <laughs> that's um, what I'm here to do George I'm here to make you smile <laughs> thank you no I'd, I'd I'd be I'd be there on the open top bus parade give me any trophy I don't care I don't care brilliant uh, and and just a quick one to you Ed because you, me- you mentioned the NFL and then um, uh, b- but but what is often said to me is, oh, you know, and that's fair because the worst team gets the first pick the following year and so on and so forth. It is so much more complicated of than course. that. And and uh, since, you know, properly working in this over the last five or six years, the, the nuances, 
the the various guidelines that are built into this system to get competitive balance patriots aside has taken years and years of financial and legal systems being put in place. It is not as simple for those that don't understand the, the NFL, but might look at it and see, oh, parity. It is not as simple as you were crap last year, you get the first pick this year. It is much more than that. So it isn't, but what an achievement to to manage to get to the level they have got, first of all. Um, and the other thing I think, obviously, is that it provides the NFL with, with a lot more unpredictability and it's a lot more com- competitive. And that really solves one of the major problems that, that George and I have talked about. Um, and George saying there, like, you know, he doesn't necessarily watch the Champions League. So for me, I, I watch Palace games and I watch the Champions League. And then I'll watch a big Premier League game if it's on. So if, if it's United City or maybe Arsenal, Liverpool is on, I'll watch that. But really, I, my football consumption is reduced down to Palace and the Champions League because there are other sports like the NFL now where I find them way more easy to watch in just a relaxed way because it's just it's competitive entertainment which you can't guarantee probably from like 70% of Premier League games anymore. Uh, Let's have a final thought from all three of you then. David, you can go first. Do you think two points in three years time if we do something similar do you think things will have changed? Firstly, in the Premier League, and secondly, what one thing would you like to see have changed that would have improved it? Actually, I agree with George's point on on the Champions League that we were just talking about a minute ago because my overriding feeling is that we've been here before with this breakaway talk so many times and I think yet again it will be resisted and will probably be in a pretty similar form to what we've got now. These things never seem to come to fruition. Maybe they will one day, but the power of UEFA in the leagues and it was interesting. I spoke to a few different contacts around Europe before coming on to do this and and they all said the one league that's going to come out of this crisis in the best shape is the Premier League around Europe. I think the power of the Premier League is going nowhere and that's why I don't think it will change that much in the coming years. One thing I'd love to see and I'm almost certain it won't come to fruition because the Premier League is you could say understandably sort of hell bent on always being the best league and and not wanting to lose its best players but if we really care about the financial sustainability of this division this sport that the lower divisions as well and have a real commitment to some sort of equality and sustainability in this country. I'd love to see a a salary cap of of some form. The practicalities are very difficult. We would definitely lose some talent from the Premier League. But if the brand can still stay attractive enough to, to bring in some really good players and we can maintain a high level of football uh, while having an element of control over spending on player wages could even potentially say transfer fees as well then we are in a position where we could have a sort of balance that many of us are craving of course fans of the biggest clubs might not be at all but uh, many of us who have of more neutral persuasion would love that ed do you think it will be different if we do this in three years time and what one thing would you change i think that what's happening right now means that we're more likely to not diverge from the the Premier League model. I think the European Super League requires a certain set of circumstances to happen and we we don't have them at the moment and I think we're not going to have them over the next couple of years. So I think, unfortunately, what we're going to see is further stratification between the financial strength of the big teams and the small teams in the Premier League. Um, I think we're going to see some League One and League Two clubs go under and people will realise that there used to be a big gap when you got relegated from the Premier League to the Championship, but now the gap between the Championship and League One, because so many teams have benefited from parachute payments, is is kind of going to be the new gap. And it would not surprise me if the next kind of uh, question that came out of the Premier League's kind of reformation and stuff might be turning the Championship into a, into a kind of PL2 rather than heading towards that European Super League model that we've kind of thought was inevitable for the last few years. George? Well, I suppose, as you as you showed with going back through the decades, there's always, there have always been a big, there's always been a big something, whether it's been a big four, big six, and I guess that's not going to change anytime 
anytime soon. Um, you know, those the the names of those clubs might change slightly in terms of who was on the up upswing and and vice versa. But that's always been there, and I would you know I think that will that will kind of always be the case. I think one way that we could look at changing the way we we think about football is I mean it's not going to happen, but take away the prize money from the Premier League. So, okay, fine, everyone gets the same flat amount of money for being in the Premier League, but we stop rewarding the people at the top differently than we reward the people at the bottom. And then, you know, I would I would redistribute that money through the game somewhere. It's not going to happen because the reason, you know, the Premier League came into existence in the first place was about having greater control over money and, and rulemaking and all that kind of stuff. But that would be the way I would change it i would try and change that sliding scale if you take that away then at least it feels more like a level playing field at the start that you all have the same base amount of money and you know you can compete like that well george david ed thank you very much for being with us uh, on this first podcast a brand new podcast from the athletic where we're debating the future of football another one will drop for you next week